I want to take you on an adventure. I want to share with you some of my opinions, some observations, and a little bit of data. In fact, a whole lot of data, but hopefully in a consumable way. Um, and really point you to where there is a lot more data that may be very useful for you. Um, and it's about an area that I've become very passionate about. Now, I am passionate about everything that relates to recruiting, but I'm particularly passionate about our need to impact all and influence all of the different stakeholders, especially the one that uh, often gets lost in that process, the candidate. So I'm going to do three things today. One, I want to share with you some of my opinions about what we're talking about when we're talking about a candidate so that at least you know what page I'm on. You may not be on the same page. I've been tilting at windmills for a long time. And so, uh, but it's important for me to be clear about what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the candidate. The second thing I want to do is be able to share with you some of the change that's taken place in the last few years in terms of our ability to collect data about the candidate's interests, attitudes, behaviors, and its impact on your company. And that is growing at a rather rapid pace. So I want to take a few minutes to at least set the stage and say, okay, here's where the data is coming from. There's a lot of data out there, a lot of research reports. You should be questioning all of them in terms of making sure that the quality of the data being collected is useful for you in terms of the decisions that you want to make. So that's, I want to spend a little bit of time on that. And then, I promise, I will tell you some of the best practices that are out there, some of the data that we're collecting that imply how we need to shift our practices if, in fact, we want to compete more effectively downstream as it relates to the candidate's ability to become a lot more of a powerful partner than a supplicant looking for your job. And that's really what's happening out there. So I want to take into account some of that change. And if you want to, you can push back at any point in time. And I'll answer your question. We'll keep it on time. So without further ado, I think if we set the stage for a moment, and, and by the way, if there's two things you probably should know about me. One is that I view myself as a student. I am in a continuous learning process. I have a lot of fun. One of the things that I do on a yearly basis is go to different countries, live with recruiters, and watch them recruit. So I've done that in 20 countries now. So um, you've got to imagine that's pretty bizarre when you're in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, or in Montevideo, um, living with recruiters and watching how they do it there. It's very different than in China, than in India, than here. But by getting a little bit outside your box, you start, seeing, you start seeing how that might impact you. So that's one thing. The other thing is probably apply to more than 500 companies a year under an assumed name. <laughs> so if you are, um, where is Stu Leonard? Yes. So if you are among the 100 best companies in America to work for, you have my resumes in your system. Um, they all do. And what I do is I measure how they treat me. And obviously, I don't put it under Jerry Crispin. I have a lot of weird names that I've used. The first one was about 10 years ago. It was uh, Vinnie Boombots. I was a credit and collections expert for uh, uh, Bada Bing Corporation. I've gotten a little bit of trouble. That's a, that's a whole different story and presentation for another time. But, but it leads into some of this. So the first thing I want to get across is, what are we talking about when we're talking about candidate? And so to do that, let's back off just a moment and think customer for a moment. OK, so here's a customer. You, are, you own this restaurant. This is the message you just got from your, one of your, quote, customers. And, and I want to make a couple points. Today, unlike 10, 15 years ago, we can measure this, OK? Most of you who are involved in marketing know that you're now measuring a, a net promoter score of your customers. And that's telling you about the health of your customer population. I'm not going to get into the calculations, et cetera. But the point is, we are now asking customers on a regular basis about their experience. 
and we're looking into whether or not that impacts our business performance downstream. And you know what? It does. Over the last 10 years since that was published, NPS was first published in Harvard Business Review, we've discovered that the health of your customer base in terms of measured by this net promoter score in fact impacts the extent to which your, your ability to sell grows. And what we're now finding is that a similar question asked of your candidates in fact correlates very highly with the health of your uh, candidate experience and has correlations to retention and to your, co your company's bottom line performance. So increasingly we're now collecting data that allows us to show that candidate health in fact impacts you. It's not just the candidates you hire, it's the ones you don't hire as well. And we're in a new world when it comes to that. Now this, the, another issue here is, will you measure this person? Will you be able to? And the answer is probably no. They left before you could give them that survey. So now you have to ask yourself from a candidate point of view, are there people who are coming and considering you, coming to your website, sending notes to you, whatever, who never get as far as they need to in terms of applying? Are there people applying who shouldn't be applying? You know, what are you measuring and where are you measuring it? Most people, when they think about what a candidate is, they tend to think one of these four things. They tend to think it's like everybody who could ever possibly work in my company, um, all the way to just the finalists. So when I ask companies, do you measure candidate experience? They go, oh yes, well tell me how you do that. And they said, well, when a new employee comes on board, we ask them about their experience. Well, that was one person. How many other people did you have apply? Anybody know, anybody have 50 or more people applying for every job on average? Some folks shaking their head, right? Over the last two years, the data we are collecting suggests that the number of people on average applying to a job has gone from 125 to now almost 185 people applying for a job. I'm not sure you should let 185 people apply for a job. But the fact of the matter is, that number is increasing. You're hiring one and you've got an awful lot of other people out there. And so that has an impact on you and that's what I want to look at. This, however, is the only thing you're going to hear from a candidate about when they think they became a candidate. It's the moment that they said, I'm interested in you. When they threw their hat in the ring, they believed they were a candidate. And during the course of today, several speakers spoke about expectations, setting expectations. Well, I got to tell you, the moment I throw my hat in the ring for your company, that's the moment I have expectations about how I'm going to be treated from this point on, whether I'm qualified or not. And so if you don't set them for me, I'm operating on the basis of the ones that I have in my head. And if you don't meet them, and you don't even know if you met them, that impacts my attitudes, my behavior, who I tell, all of those things. So I don't think you can ignore that any longer. We really need to care about it because when you're dealing with 100 people plus for everyone that you hire, there's a whole host of things that are happening for those that you did not hire. Whether or not they would gain the information, if they learned enough, about what they need in order to compete more effectively to the job, will they come back and reapply? Do you know, for example, what percentage of those you do not hire would come back and reapply? And I'm going to show you later, towards the end, that if the answer is they had a negative experience, less than 5% would do it. If they have a positive experience, 60% would do it. Which recruiting process do you want? You know, and so that's the kind of issue that we're starting to look at if we can collect the data around it. So now I want to tell you a little bit about 
what we did to collect some data. Started this four years ago. I got a call from some friends in the space that basically said, we've been tilting at this windmill for a long time, talking about how bad companies are in their candidate experience. And really, what we should be doing is talking about the companies that are doing a great job, putting a lot of energy, effort. I'm sure there are companies in this room that are doing a great job. I know that, uh, I know a few that are doing a great job. And that's powerful, but I think we have a responsibility as a space to kind of out them, to make sure that we better understand what they're doing so that we can see how that might apply to us. And part of it is anecdotal. You know, what is the cool story? But part of it is collecting data in a consistent way so everybody can use it well. So we started four years ago asking companies to participate in a survey process that had two rounds. The first round is tell me about your practices from the point at which people come and research you to their interview process, to their application, to how you, to how you tell them no or you're not going to come in or that's it, we're done with you, to the onboarding process, to the offer process, all of those pieces. So that's pretty comprehensive and we, we got about 20, 30 companies initially to do that but I'm not going to take you through each year. I'm going to tell you what we did in 2014, over a six-month period in 2014. 200 companies said they would participate, registered with us. And, sh and about um, 180 of those actually completed a survey in which they shared an extraordinary amount of information. So a heavily involved online survey developed by some PhDs in survey design and a whole bunch of volunteers, so some really good stuff, all into the database. About 150 50 of them said, we'll go to the next level, which is, we'll ask our candidates to confirm what we think we're doing and tell us you know, their reaction to that. Now, that's, that's, a big, that's a big statement to do that. And I will tell you that a number of companies went to their bosses and their lawyers said, no, are you kidding me? We're not going to ask them. Some of the PR folks said, no, we're not going to do that. But a lot did. Many of them did. Um, approximately 130 ended up doing it in enough, with enough numbers that they could qualify. So we required that every company had enough people, enough candidates respond that we could use the data, number one, and we also required that 80 percent of the candidates that responded at least had to be people that they did not hire. So it's not just the ones you hired. So that's pretty gutsy, looking in the mirror that way. We did promise that anyone whose candidates really hated them we would never out their name, and so we would not be talking about loser, you know. We'd just be talking about, you've got some great data that you can use to improve where you are to where you want to go. So that was pretty powerful. So I want you to think for just a second, how many total candidates were we able to get for those 130 companies? Anybody want to hazard a guess? How many? 400, 500. There you go. 95,400 candidate surveys completed. Detailed. We're crunching that now. We have a team of about 30 people writing a, a white paper on the subject. The last year that this was done is available and free on a website called thecandies.org. It's 65 pages, boring as hell. <laughs> but I gotta tell you, if you're into data, go have a ball. A number of companies are using that data today to change the game in how they treat candidates. And that's not treating every candidate the same. That's being very clear about which candidates you're going to treat in what ways, but setting expectations along that way. So the data, what I'm gonna talk about has to do with that data. 
okay, because it's powerful and it's still, it's still flowing in. It's like a fire hose. It is free. No employer has paid a dime. That's the other thing you should all know. I'm not selling anything. Um, basically, this is a missionary effort on the part of a lot of people in the field um, because we believe you should be doing this kind of stuff. You should be looking at this for yourself and every single company that participated gets all their data back, all their candidates' data, and a bench of all the candidates who, from a um, metric point of view, are positive. So there's a bench of those companies' candidates who are positive about the experience even though they did not get hired. They're the ones we want to study, right? Because we want to know what, is the, what are they doing that's different than everybody else. And that were 62 companies. So two years ago, these were the companies that won in 2013. This is 2014. So these are the companies whose data from their candidates added up to about 95,000 candidates and that we're taking a close look at in terms of what, what makes for you know, these candidates being treated differently. And how does that impact their recruiting process? Is everybody good on that? I think it's important. I know it takes a little while to you know, kind of get into it, but the reality is I think that's important. It's quality data. And I'm going to give you a little bit around that. So every single company that participated had a story. And anecdotally, some of the things they were doing, some of their practices probably had a major impact before you even started looking at at the details of all of those. And I'll give you some examples of those. So Under Armour, for example, they, um, they require every candidate go through an interview prep course online. So they create an online course. If you're going to come in for an interview, you got to go through the course. Why? Because they want to try and create a common platform so that every interviewee should have some level of competence, the base level of competence, so we're not measuring what, you know, differences in how well you interview. Now, does that handle it all? Of course not. But at least it's an aspiration in that direction. I think it's very powerful. Companies like Enterprise tell uh, the candidates who the recruiter is. They have 300 recruiters. So I can find your phone number, the address of where you work, the uh, email address, uh, just about everything, all your contact information for all 300. Kind of interesting. How many of you post on your career site your contact information? I love it. That's great. That's fabulous. Um, most of you do not. And because there's a fear, right, of what's going to happen. The, the question is, you don't know the answer to it until you do it. So one of the issues, one of the issues is how you, how you create a two-way kind of connection between you and candidates out there in a way that does not, does not, you know, use all your resources up or creates a problem that drives you nuts. You know, you have all the crazies coming. So different companies handle it in different ways, but I'm telling you some companies do it just out there. Enterprise does it. They hire 9,000 people you know, a year, so there's a, there's a clear reason for them to do it. Lockheed does it in a whole different way. The only profiles and contact information they provide are for the three or four military recruiters who are profiled, so they're described, their background, their entire profile is out there, their names, what they're focused on, and they're encouraged to be called by anybody who's in military transition. Does that make sense? Of course it does. It's very logical. And more and more you're seeing that, that kind of trend. It obviously has an impact on the candidates in terms of their perception about being able to get the information they need to decide whether to move further. Because remember now, we're not just talking about them as individuals who line up that we assess, but they're individuals that we're partnering with to figure out if we can help them make a better decision as well to move forward. Other companies try it a different way. So for example, RMS, a small company, 
has a chat room. A number of companies have chat rooms. Theirs is a little bit different. They run it every day. They focus in on PhDs in mathematics. And the tagline that they have for the chat room is, if you, if you have honest questions, we have honest answers. And every question, every question that's asked is answered. The, the recruiter who is going to be in the chat room on a given day is empowered to answer every question, like what happened to that person in the job before, or how many of these people did this, or how many uh, female uh, PhDs in mathematics do you in fact have, and how long is their average tenure? Those kinds of questions. In some cases, you don't know the answer. In other cases, if you did, you wouldn't be allowed to tell the answer. My point is, transparency has, a, has some clarity around it, and so companies like RMS, Lockheed, and others are realizing that we, we can't kind of have a one-on-one -on -one relationship all the time, but we can do periodically, whether it's once a day, once a week, et cetera, for a couple hours, we can create a chat room and invite people to come in and have a conversation. We can set expectations about what we can or cannot talk about. So if you're honest with them, you're starting to get a whole different kind of thing across. And you're trying to, you're also now engaging people not only to whether or not they apply, but whether they know somebody who might apply who's really going to be qualified. So increasing the percentage of those people who apply who really are fully qualified and changing that demographic as well. So I find that fascinating. Companies like Corning, are, and Peter Weddle uh, addressed it, I think, in the last session that I was in, uh, talking about expectations. But um, when I think about expectations, I would look at your career site and I'd say, okay, tell me, is there anything on your, your website that helps me understand what happens next? What happens if you do like me? What happens if you don't like me? What, ha what is the next step? And if it is interviews or phone screens or whatever, how do you conduct them? What is a behaviorally based, you know, interview? What is that? You know, and is it a panel or not a panel? Can I expect how many, all, all of that kind of information are sets of expectations from beginning to end. And the extent of, of you putting that stuff out there is not being done very well right now. But companies like Corning are doing it very well. Another one, uh, uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories is another one. There's only about four or five companies in the United States that set expectations about what comes next. Really. So that's kind of an interesting set of issues, I think. Um, Intuit actually trains their recruiters. Think about this. Trains their recruiters to provide feedback for all internal candidates. They don't have the guts yet to do it for external candidates. Not too many people do. Disney's the only one that I know of. But, but Intuit has trained all the recruiters in counseling to give feedback to internal candidates. I just find that fascinating, isn't it? Adidas actually, in their, their recruiter training, brings in candidates does mock interviews with real candidates and then has the candidates give feedback to the recruiters. So if you like these little wow things, they're all anecdotal, but I think they, they offered a little bit of what kind of attitude these companies had who in the end have candidates that are positive even when, even when they didn't hire them. Last one I'll mention, uh, Capital One has, I think, is about two to three years ahead of almost any other company in terms of their metrics for measuring uh, the candidate experience. Extraordinarily powerful in their card division. They essentially ask every single candidate after they disposition the, the job or close the job, three days, within three days, they then ask every single candidate 16 questions. That includes all the people that did not get hired. That's 10,000 people they're asking every month, and 80% of them are responding. So they have a full-time analyst that takes that data stream coming in, 
and can slice and dice it by the facility, by the job family, by the level, and by the recruiter. Every recruiter is stack ranked on their candidate experience index every month and they have um, a shifting uh, uh, NPS, net promoter score, uh, on their dashboard every day. A hiring manager one as well. Everybody's sitting there going, yeah, no, nah, I don't know if I want to go that far. Yeah. Um, before you leave the slide, can you talk about Deloitte and Privet's candidate goals versus expectations? Yeah, um, Deloitte specifically did the kind of research that I think has to be done by a large company. Smaller companies, no. But a large company has an extraordinary number of candidates in the end. And what they did is they, they did some foundational kind of research. They went to about 3,000 of their candidates and in effect did in-depth personal surveys of all of them to basically better understand what the interests, values, needs of that, that type of candidate was. And then they said, okay, if that's so, how well are we meeting those? If that's their career goals and career aspirations, are we providing them with information that helps them? Got that? Is that it? Okay. Anyhow, those are some of the, the ideas. I'd be happy to chat more in more depth, but I want to give you some overall pieces of information here. So one of them is just the sense of what kind of employers were involved here. And so I want you to look at that bottom left-hand corner. A third hired up to, but not more than 100 people a year. That's modest-sized companies. So the, the data that we're collecting isn't from just huge companies like Deloitte that are hiring 40,000 people, but smaller companies. When we looked at the 95,000 candidates, it was almost equal in terms of male-female, so gender differences are something we can slice and dice, and to date we have not really found much from a gender difference. Um, I think we can ask some other questions next year around that. Uh, it was pretty normal distribution in terms of the age cohorts that people represented, but I'm starting to look at, for example, what are the differences between college and uh, boomers or what have you to see if there are some interesting differences. Now I will tell you there's one oddball counterintuitive one uh, that that has come up and that is the extent to which you will share publicly a bad experience. You would think that Millennials would be much more willing to share publicly a bad experience in recruiting but they're not. And I think that the reason is because they've been getting coached not to burn bridges. So, you know, tell your friends, but don't go beyond that. Um, whereas the boomers are way more than willing <laughs> to share publicly because they figure, you know, over and done. So I just find that kind of a fascinating thing. The other and Peter uh, talked about it in, in the last uh, session, too, um, was I find it somewhat ironic that of the top five things that respondents say were most useful in terms of making choices about moving ahead was job description, and yet the job description is probably one of the worst things we actually put out there from a, from a content point of view. There's so much more we can do. But it does tell you how important it is to them, and it probably convinces many to apply when they shouldn't be, um, and perhaps a little bit of vice versa. We're looking at, uh, just showing you some of the, the things that we're kind of looking at, is candidate search, job search behavior. Now this is not what they fa used to find a job. This is what they're using to try and find a job. Different. So it's not what made, was successful for them, but it's what, it's what these 95,000 candidates, broken down in this case by, by um, age cohort, were using in looking at Facebook, Glassdoor, Google, Internet, LinkedIn, et cetera. I find it interesting how much Google Plus is something that candidates are using, but very few companies 
are, are, have figured out how to leverage. So it's just, it's just a, a, I find this an interesting approach just to see how things are going. Now, it'd be great if you had your data. My point is, each of the camp folks who are participating, they have their own data, and they can look at a bench as well. Mention that applicants, this is, the, this is 2012, 2013, and I think it's about 185 for 2014. And you can see that there's an extraordinary distribution. There's no real average here. Obviously, some companies are getting 200 and more per job, and some companies are getting much less. And it's not just hourly versus professional. You're seeing, seeing it all over the map, but there has been a growth. We're looking at that issue and seeing whether that's impacting uh, some of the downstream behavior. This is a distribution of how long it takes to complete your applications. And you can see, again, a normal distribution where only about 4% are more than 90, but <coughs> most people's online applications take between 16 and 60 minutes. Now here's something of interest. Doesn't, it does not change their attitude, and it doesn't change their behavior. So even though you might abuse the heck out of your candidates by making them jump through all kinds of hoops, if you give them some rationale, some expectation as to what you're doing and why, it may annoy them, may irritate them, they may complain about it, but it does not change the outcome in terms of whether or not they're going to rate your company in terms of a negative candidate satisfaction. In fact, it may add positively if, in fact, it helps them to make better choices and decisions. So if you embed information that helps them make better choices and decisions, it could be a positive by spending a little more time and energy and knowing that this is the right company that I really want to work for. On the other hand, if you add up a lot of the things that annoy people, yeah, that whole cluster is probably going to kill your candidate experience. The one thing that we're finding, in fact, there's a, a dissertation that was submitted uh, in September. It uh, will be defended in, in uh, March of next year. Um, takes into account last year's data, which was about 45,000 candidates, and focuses in on a specific cluster of, of uh, practices that I'm going to describe in a second. And it is the one set of practices that we have identified that absolutely drives people negative or positive. Interesting. I love it. And it's not rocket science. None of this is, really, when you think about it. All of you will recognize it. So, what, what it has to do is uh, uh, an idea called perceived fairness on the part of the candidate. The extent to which the candidate believes that they fairly are being judged, that they fairly got up to bat and were able to swing. And the kind of practice that, that, exhi that, that exhibits that or, or affects that, influences that, um, can be found in a variety of places. It can be found in the interview, the interview day, uh, the phone screen, and the application. So let me give you the examples. In the application, ask yourself, is the last question you ask, sort of like one of those waiting for the whatever, uh, is the last question you ask, um, did we are there any questions we did not ask about your skills, knowledge, and experience that you think are important for this job? And you could probably say that better than I. But rather than ask the question that you think is important, at some point, They've all, been they've all been preparing themselves to answer a whole bunch of questions, some of which you asked and some of which you did not ask, but they think are important for them to be successful in competing for this job. At the end of the phone screen, 
if you say for 20 minutes I've been asking you a bunch of questions is there a question or questions that we have not asked you is there anything we haven't asked you about your experience about your background that you think is important for you to compete for this job same with the interview same with the end of the interview day if you do that you will increase significantly the likelihood that people you do not hire as well as those who you do believe that they fairly got a good shot at getting up to bat for this job I find that fascinating and if they if you don't ask those questions they tend to trend negative so what is the impact of that couple things one last, there's one other practice that I think, I think is very important to, to review, and then I'm going to give you basically what the results of some of that is in terms of behavior as well as the impact on your company. Uh, this has to do with referrals. How many of you all have referrals? Anybody doesn't have a referral program of some sort? You know, so you think about it. Almost everybody, 97, 98% of all the companies out there have a referral program. But if you ask the candidates, they're not aware of it. Half of them, even at the executive level, and you think they should be, do not know that you have a referral program because you talk to your employees, not to them. And do they know how important it is? Of course not. If you didn't tell them about it, how could they possibly know how important it is? Fewer than a third of those who are even aware think it's an important issue. Now, I find that amazing. I think it's pathetic, but, I, but it, is, it is what is. And as a result of that, um, they may not be taking advantage of initiating, using social media, using anything they could to get an employee in your company to refer them. And so there's a whole bit that's missed. So I'm going to give you an example. If 100 people applied for a job, only four of those 100, on average, were referred by an employee. Well, let's look at how, that, how this works out. Half of all the, the candidates are not qualified. And I'm, I'm using a conservative number, okay, based on the data that we have. And about five become finalists. And what an amazing coincidence, the two qualified referrals almost always become among two of the, of the five. Now, how interesting is that? So probability would suggest that 40%, if you do this, if this fits you, 40% of your hires are referrals. All things being equal, they're not, but that's okay. So you just got to think about this. The system is gamed, but you're not giving everybody a fair shot at gaming them. Only the people who have a coach who tells them how important it is for them to get an internal referral and they go get it are the ones who are going to increase their probability for getting hired. So we have not only a broken system, we have a gamed system around this. If in fact you use a little probability table, if you have a referral and there's a hundred people that applied for the job but an employee inside referred you, 20 percent will get the job. If you do not have a referral, 1.2% will get a job. That's a 14-time difference. Look at your own data. Tell me that I'm, tell me that I'm off. But uh, this data comes from not only this study, but every single study that I've seen in the last 15 years. It's not changed. And our systems and technologies continue to push this in a big way. All I'm suggesting, if from a candidate experience point of view, again, setting expectations. How many people did you hire last year from employee referrals? Why wouldn't you share that? There's only two companies I know of in the United States who share that information on their career site. TiVo, for example, has a little pie chart, and before you apply, it says 48% of all the people we hired last year came from employee referrals. Well, you know what? I'd be pretty dumb not to go get myself an employee referral. 
or attempt to. So there's some interesting issues here that we haven't taken a look at. Um, just to finish off, a couple oddball things that all of you should be aware of. And, and if you're retail, you already know this. But about 60% of all the people who apply to your company already have a positive feeling toward you. They might be a customer. And, and that's why in a retail setting, you almost know that a significant number of all the people who apply are customers. They like you. They already like you. They have family or they have friends or they admire you or they've read about you. They're all positive from that point of view. So they are yours to lose. And if you lose them, the negative affect of that has enormous downstream implications that we can now measure. Researching you, about 40%, which is the largest group, that's a, I need to change the color on that, um, about 40% of the candidates who apply spend about one to two hours researching you. Now what's interesting is the people who spend the least amount of time inter, uh, inter or researching you are also the ones that know, that know you the least. They're among that 40% that don't have an affinity, don't have a connection to you. They actually research you less, which suggests to me, and, and as a result of that, are more likely to end up negative. So if you know, coming in, that somebody doesn't know much about you, you should be encouraging them to spend a little time to get to know you so that they have a better sense of what you can or cannot do. So their sense of perceived fairness is shifted in this whole thing. Um, communication, we know that if your interest is uh, getting an email and you get an email, it's a positive. If it's not, if you don't get it that way, it's annoying. If you have an expectation that somebody's going to call you and they don't call you, you're annoyed. Why would they have an expectation you're going to call them and tell them that you're not going to hire them? They do, but it's because you haven't set expectations. So it's kind of interesting from that point of view. So we complain about candidates, but we really should respect the fact that they just have not been taught some things that we thought they should know. And we need to teach them about what that means here. And if we do, I think we're doing the best that we possibly can, and I don't think it's hard. It's pretty easy to do that. And, and the last was this content piece about 80% finding job descriptions useful. Um, you need to think about what is it that's most useful to your, to your best candidates that you end up hiring, and make sure that that content is the best you can possibly make it. So if it's a set of expectations, if it's uh, a better you know, video about how the job is done, those are the things you should be spending time, energy, and effort on. Last thing I want to mention is there's a bias in the group of companies that we collected data on, obviously. They thought that they were doing a better job with candidates, so just the group itself was much more focused on including companies that are doing a great job in candidate experience um, but also, only about 18% of candidates said that they had a black hole. That, in fact, they never heard. When they were not hired, they never heard. They were never informed, etc. 18% is a very low number. Even among the 100 best companies in America to work for, 18% is a low number. So, so I will tell you that there is, a, there is a little bit of a bias here, but you can learn certainly from that. There is no excuse for any company in not finding a way to close a job and tell every single candidate, at least with some kind of email, that the job has been filled. Thank you very much for having considered us. We hope you'll consider us in the future, or whatever you can possibly do. The best I've ever seen has been Zappos. Remember, I apply to 100, 100 of the best companies in America to work for every year. Um, and a few hundred others. So I get a lot of rejection letters. <laughs> and the best I have ever gotten, 
by a long shot over the last few years has been Zappos. So I encourage you to apply to Zappos. <laughs> I'm pretty damn sure you're going to get, you know. Now obviously they've tried to uh, uh, eliminate that, um, uh, your application. They've, they've had some really interesting things going on recently, but there's still a few jobs that they will take applications for. So you can always apply for that and get turned down. It's good stuff. Um, how likely are you to apply again is the key question we ask at the end. Okay, so I'm coming to the end. I, wanted, I just want to give you some, some really interesting data that companies are now using to calculate this ROI. How likely are you to apply again? If your candidate experience was positive, about 62% are extremely likely to apply again. If it was negative, only 5% are extremely likely and a quarter of them would never, ever apply again. How likely are you to refer someone in the future? And this is the net promoter score type of thing, which can go from minus 100 to 100. Um, again, 61% would actively encourage others to apply and almost none of them would say I would go out of my way to discourage others. But if their experience was negative, a quarter of them would actively discourage others from applying. There's a cost to that in your recruiting process. If you think about how expensive it is to now replace all of this, all of this, um, with new, new candidates in a constant way, you don't want to be able to do that. How likely are you to change your status as a customer? 38% who had a positive experience said, said they will increase. Now whether they do or not, the smaller percentage would actually do it, but this is what their intent is. And if their experience was negative, 30% are saying, I'll take my purchasing power elsewhere. These are your candidates. This is not good for a retail establishment, for sure. Um, how likely are you to share with your inner circle? What we learned is that no matter what your age, your inner circle is probably the same number of people, somewhere between four and six. Um, however, people are pretty open about sharing. 82% said they'd share positive, 65% said they would share negative with their inner circle. Not bad. Now, would you go public? 51 and 34%. The thing to note about this is over the last three years, that number's doubled. So increasingly, people are becoming more comfortable engaging, whether it be social media or other aspects of work, um, to sharing that. And so now they're influencing others as well. Yes? Which, which number's doubled? Positive and negative? Both positive and negative. Four, uh, three years ago, it was about 20, 26, 25 to 35% typically, depending on the group. And this was between 15 and 20. So, so sh there is a shift going on. We know that. You all know that. This is the unintended consequence of it, though, is the extent to which people are hearing those things. So I'm going to give you, this is my last piece. This is a, sort of a future thing uh, to think about candidates and candidate experience. If any of you, and I'm not going to ask any weird questions here, but if any of you have ever um, gone on any of these sites, and I only did that recently, <laughs> mystery shopping. I'm married 43 years, so I just, you know, I, I was totally clueless. Um, but there is, you want to think about this for just a second. How can you possibly build a relationship between you and another human being if you don't have equal sharing back and forth? So this stuff does not work unless the questions are answered by both parties at the same level of intimacy. Got to think about that when you think about transparency. We have a recruiting process in which we demand and we have more and more tools that allow us to dig deep into the backgrounds of every one of our candidates. But we're not necessarily sharing what an idiot the hiring manager is that we're hiring them for. <laughs> and how many he or she has, you know, 
pushed out of our organization over the last two, three, four years. But things are changing. They will change. I can coach almost anyone to identify who the recruiter is, whether you give me that information or not. I can track down the hiring manager that your job um, is posted for, whether or not you put out who that hiring manager is. My tools are really good for sourcing on the net. And I got to tell you, nine times out of 10, I'm going to be right on target. And then I can start looking for that individual's footprint in 30, 40 different places all over the world. And I'm going to know what an idiot that person is or not. And I'm going to make my own choices. We're coaching people to do that. We all are, every one of you. If you've got a friend looking for a job, you're teaching them a whole set of tools and techniques. We need to think about that. So I will tell you that this uh, company, eHarmony, is in fact starting a job board uh, this month. <laughs> Believe it or not, they decided they didn't want to be, they didn't want to let anybody else be the eHarmony of recruiting. They decided they had to be. And they have two, and I don't care whether they succeed or not, but, but what I do care about is they will force two things. One, they're going to force First of all, they're going to force us to think about what questions do we ask each other. If I'm going to ask you about all of the performance background you know, in other companies that you've had and to do a background check around that, what are you going to do to supply me with information about the style of the hiring manager, the collaboration style of the, of the team that I'm going to be working with? That's powerful. And that can help you to attract some of the very best and brightest, but it can also damn you if, you if you hide it. So that's another issue. And the second thing that eHarmony is going to do when they do this, think about what they do you know, with, uh, with a match. They don't just stop. They ask you how the date went. They ask you whether you got engaged. They ask you whether you got married. They ask you how the marriage is going. Not only once, but they keep on doing it. And you know what? They learn from that, and they take that data, and they put it back into improving the way in which they make a match. Well, you know what? That's what recruiting needs to do. We need to not stop at the door. We need to better understand how our choices as recruiters, hiring managers, and others, as companies, how they worked out, whether it's our fault or not. The point is, we need to learn from that, and in doing so, we're going to have an extraordinary experience. So this is the last slide. Um, we are at a fork in the road. You're supposed to laugh at that. Um, there are uh, some, I think, loose cases, uh, so, some low-hanging fruit that I really want to just quickly state. You've got to build a business case. You've got to have an ROI. You have to take the data that you collect or the data you get from other places and infer what the cost is within your organization. Secondly, I see we're going to increasingly learn new things. Everyone should feel like they got up to bat. You can ask any candidate, do you feel like you got up to bat? Were you able to share all the things that you thought you needed to share with us so we can make our best decision? Did you get everything you need for you to make your best decision? You can do that. You can do it now. You can seek feedback so you can look in the mirror and find out how you're doing not only with the ones you hire, but the ones that you do not, particularly those who are finalists who you may want to hire down the road. Set expectations. You've heard it throughout the day, and I've got to tell you, think about what that actually means and how you can do that, either in your first touch point with the candidate, on your career site, whatever. You do those things, I think you're going to increase your candidate experience significantly, and I challenge all of you to walk in your shoes, walk in the shoes of a candidate at least once a year, go apply for a job in your own company. Just see how that works out for you. I just, I just think we don't do that enough, and every recruiter owes it to themselves, and I think every recruiting leader owes it to their company to have their recruiters do some of that kind of thing. So a little bit of... Uh, applying to your competitors to see what they can do better than you can in terms of that process, 
all kinds of possibilities. You do those things, think outside the box. I wish you good hunting. Thank you. Cool.